This place is meant to be in charge. But with five prime ministers in six years, it hasn't felt that way. The whole operation number 10 was utterly broken down. What's the answer? We became a laughingstock of the world. An utter catastrophic disaster. In this series, we're trying to work out what happened to our political system. I think we lost our minds. I don't know a single MP who didn't get a death threat. The party that likes to believe it's born to rule has indulged in an epic drama with no lasting heroes. I have been a systematic plotter who's tried to remove the Prime Minister. You are not children in the playground. You are legislators. I'm Laura Kunzberg, and I was the BBC's political editor for nearly seven years. It was my job to make sense of what on earth was going on, or at least to try, as we all lived through a norm-busting, convention-defying moment of history. Was Boris Johnson a good Prime Minister? Um... No. Boris is an extremely complex character. In this episode, a maverick Prime Minister and his power-hungry advisor face the biggest crisis since the Second World War, with dramatic results. And I said he won't be satisfied until he burns the house down. Months in the making, working with insiders who've never spoken publicly before, we go behind the scenes to Westminster's real cast list. The civil servants, the ministers, and the political advisers now free to speak. During Boris's era, you had people in power who felt the brand of Boris was so great that they could get away with anything. How close did our political system come to falling apart? And will it ever be the same again? It is the end of normal. It is 10 o'clock and the polls in the general election suggest that it is a conservative majority. And if these numbers are broadly correct, Boris Johnson may just have redrawn the map. I would like to thank Boris. Boris, Boris, Boris. The winner took it all. After months of paralysis in Parliament, a mammoth majority meant opportunity. Well, we did it. We did it. We pulled it off, didn't we? My favourite film is Gladiator. You know, when he stands there, I am Gladiator. That's what he must have felt like. It, you know, if, if you want to put Gladiator into political terms, he was a man who had done something extraordinary. Yeah, and there he was standing in front of the Colosseum. Amazing, I mean, amazing. <laughs> Boris Johnson is a very vivacious character and can relate to people all over the country. It was a night of delirium for almost every single Conservative MP because result after result after result was blue, 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 will never turn blue, has never been blue, is now Conservative. It was an amazing feeling. I was in Downing Street when the results came through. It was incredible. It wasn't just a win, it was a, an absolutely huge win. And it put an end to Jeremy Corbyn's reign. The Conservatives smashed Labour, grabbing seat after seat, in towns they'd called their own. Traditional Labour voters were reluctant to back Jeremy Corbyn. It was our worst election result in terms of seats since the mid-1930s. It was terrible. I've never knocked on so many doors, and people have said, I've always voted Labour, but... Yet it wasn't just Labour's woes. Boris Johnson had relentlessly promised to get Brexit done. I require no response from you. I require no response His vow? To end Parliament's three-year screaming match over leaving the EU. And it went down a storm. People were tired of politics being chaotic and people in Westminster arguing about it. And Boris was the politician who most closely understood that desire just to deliver and just have done. With this mandate and this majority, we will at last be able to do what? Get Brexit done! 
have been paying attention. Boris had just taken the question of Brexit to the British people, run an election campaign on getting Brexit done, and won handsomely. He just reaffirmed the democratic point that the country had decided to uh, to leave the European Union. With an 80-seat majority, I think the, I'm right in saying the, the biggest cassette of majorities since Margaret Thatcher's time, you know, so it was, it was, you know, it felt huge, and there's a lot to look forward to, and a lot could be done. I mean, this was the opportunity to do something remarkable, to change politics for good. Boris Johnson now held real power in the country and in his party. But to many of us in Whitehall, it was clear the man who helped put him there had his eyes on a big prize too. His most senior advisor, Dominic Cummings, wanted control. And with an 80-seat majority, Boris Johnson could grant it. Everybody knew that Dominic Cummings was key in the operation, but nobody really knew what the bounds were of his power or what the relationship uh, was with the Prime Minister. So everybody's trying to work this out from very early on. The two men's bond had been forged in the Vote Leave campaign. Cummings had been willing to smash the ceiling, literally, to pursue his cause. Installed at number 10 as Johnson's chief advisor, he loomed large over everything and everyone in government. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. Happy to be known from the shadows. Oh, oh shit. What did the man talk about live? Yeah, these are live cameras, just to let you know. Oh, oh, very funny. No, they are. No, they are. No, they are live cameras. Yeah, it's no, it's 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 you, I thought you were someone who understood technology. He saw the election win as his chance to rewire the country and change how government worked. Switch it off and walk past it. Yeah, they are live as he saw fit, whether elected politicians liked it or not. Dominic Cummings had far too much influence on, on government and, and decisions. And uh, it, it felt really that, you know, he acted like the prime minister. He felt he was the prime minister himself. So I would sort of ask number 10, is the prime minister OK with this or that? And I'd get a response. Quite often, I would find the things that I was being told by his office uh, were his decision. Boris Johnson wouldn't have no knowledge of them whatsoever. And that became a bit of an issue uh, for me. At best, it was like having two prime ministers, and sometimes they agreed and sometimes they didn't. At worst, it was you had one prime minister, it just wasn't the elected one. Every time he was in a room, the way he spoke about MPs, engaged with MPs, the way he engaged with Boris, there was such an obvious derision and contempt as if he had to manipulate the puppets of politicians so that he could achieve his great outcome that he saw, his great vision for the country. I saw Boris and, and Don up close and I saw actually a real team, a strong team. They thrived off one another. And I think what any government needs, any government of all political parties, you do need someone in there who will shake things up. You do need someone with a sort of revolutionary zeal um, that will constantly be asking why, you know, and challenging the sort of orthodoxy. So, you know, and he, he, he provided that. After he left number 10, Cummings revealed just how much he'd wanted to challenge the orthodoxy to get his own way. But you've just said that within months, of the Prime Minister winning the biggest Conservative majority in decades, you and a few others from the Vote Leave campaign were discussing the possibility of getting rid of him. Days, not months. Within days of the election, you were discussing getting rid of him? Yes. Well, for all the reasons we've been discussing. He doesn't have a plan, he doesn't know how to be Prime Minister, and we'd only got him in there because we had to solve a certain problem, not because we thought that he was the right person to run in the country. But Dominic Cummings' apparent contempt for Boris Johnson was trumped by his long-standing ambition to get the UK out of the EU. The eyes to the right, 330. The nose to the left, 231. Yeah. A deal was struck. Number 10's Independence Day had arrived. Crowds of Brexiteers cheered outside Parliament. Inside Downing Street, it was the moment the Vote Leave tribe had been waiting for. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Among the revellers,
nurse, Cleo Watson, Cummings' deputy. It was quite a strange event. There were some speeches and Johnson stood up and this was the pinnacle of his political career so far. He'd campaigned for Brexit and here we were and he stood up and kind of gave his speech about French knickers and cheese. French knickers made in this country. It was sort of gags and it was sort of fun, but there was no kind of stronger message and no sense of him having achieved this huge moment. And then Dominic Cummings stood up and you could just see how much it meant to him. Dom was just standing on a box and he started to speak and then, and he, you know, burst into tears and he couldn't, he couldn't say anything. And, you know, for him, this was the delivery of a, a long-held, strongly held belief that Britain would be better off outside the European Union. And he'd achieved it, and not only had he achieved it, but he was in Downing Street delivering it. Dominic Cummings sort of stole the show, which obviously did not go down very well, I would say, with, <laughs> with Johnson. I can remember at the time thinking, hmm, I wonder if this is going to cause us some problems because it's around that period where, you know, th there were the caricatures of Boris Johnson as Dominic Cummings' puppet. You could start to feel that tension coming in. Seven minutes past six is the time. Other news to bring you. Boris Johnson is preparing for his first major government reshuffle since the general election in December. It's thought it may not be the radical overhaul some had predicted. Cabinet reshuffles can be big news days. But after the bitterness before the election, Boris Johnson wasn't expected to stir up even more trouble at the top. Many of his existing ministers and their special advisers who work directly for them were expecting to stay, including the Chancellor, Sajid Javid. First thing the prime minister said is that you know you're you're reappointed and congratulations and of course I'm happy at that news, but then all of a sudden he said look there there is a condition and uh, and that is that you have to fire all your advisors you know I had six special advisors you have to fire them all you know no if fans and buts all all of them have to go, and you'll have a new team but don't worry about it Dominic Cummings is going to pick it for you. Dominic Cummings insisted that every special advisor across a range of government departments answered not to their ministers, ministers of the Crown, elected representatives, but would answer to him. Cummings wanted to influence the positions as much as possible. He had a plan, and the trouble is with that kind of focus, I suppose, and ability to just see how you think things should be done is that it doesn't always make room for other people. Outside number 10, it seemed something big was brewing. Yeah, fine. Do you want to give me a close quote? Text me a quote. OK, bye. I was very clear that uh, I'm not going to accept this and that he have to choose between his chancellor and, 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 and Dominic Cummings. He, he wasn't willing to make a decision and, uh, and wanted both. And I said, that's not possible. You know, I can't serve on that basis. And, uh, and, uh, and I did say to him, I don't understand the hold that this, uh, this individual has on you. And I said, you know, this individual, Mr. Cummings, he won't be satisfied until he burns the house down and you wait and see, and I walked out. In the last few minutes, I've heard that the Chancellor, Sajid Javid, has decided that rather than obey the orders of the Prime Minister to sack his advisory team, he has instead turned down the second most important job in government and has decided to resign. The Prime Minister's advisor had got rid of the Chancellor. The message to other ministers couldn't have been more clear. Cummings wanted control and Boris Johnson was willing to give it. It was Dominic Cummings' way, essentially, of controlling what happened in every department and making every minister anxious or nervous that, you know, far from having an ally, they had a potential spy um, in the office with them. Deeply, deeply dysfunctional, offensive and, you know, frankly, unconstitutional. 
The, the Prime Minister of the UK is in a very powerful position in, in government relative to their colleagues. And if they rely excessively on a small team of advisors, they are more prone to error. Boris became incredibly reliant on Dominic Cummings to a dangerous degree, dangerous for himself as well as for the conduct of government. In those early months after the election in there, they felt almost unstoppable. Leaving the EU was just the start. Dominic Cummings wanted to rewire the whole place, believing Whitehall was stuffed with the wrong people, with the wrong ideas and the wrong ways of working. Officials at the top had long said the civil service shouldn't get stuck in an unhappy status quo, open to claims of being too slow or reluctant to change. There was sympathy for the desire to shake things up. But the question was, how would Dominic Cummings go about it? I thought lots of the things he was saying, absolutely spot on. Far too much groupthink, not enough diversity of thought. And he was always going on about how do we get a different calibre of political advisors? How do, how do we really kind of get different DNA into some of them? And particularly things that we weren't naturally good at. So the, the actual idea, you know, good idea, the way of doing it, not great. It was very clear from very early on that Dominic Cummings wanted to break things, to try something completely new. It was uh, destabilising. Uh, because I, uh, I worked for the Foreign Office for 38 years. I was a company man. I ended up as the Permanent Secretary. So even though I could see absolutely the imperfections in the system, I thought basically the system was a good one. Uh, and having uh, the people at the top basically disagree with that was new and disagreeable for me personally. The job of the Whitehall Civil Service was to carry out the policy of the government of the day, not to decide whether that is a good or bad policy. There's no authority to do that. So if Whitehall is obstructing um, ministers, then Whitehall deserves to be criticised for it. While Dominic Cummings advertised for misfits and weirdos to join him in Downing Street, top civil servants were being ushered out, not with P45s at first, but dark hints in the press. I just want to show you something that ended up in one of the newspapers. Um... <laughs> uh, yes, I remember this. In the United Kingdom, civil servants are figures in the background. Uh, the deal is you are close to um, the centre of power. You have the... Your job is to advise, uh, to uh, give your ministers options. They decide, so they carry the can of accountability, but you advise in private. Under Boris Johnson, that very much shifted. Uh, so seeing my name on the front page of the Sunday Telegraph as one of four people on a number 10 hit list was surprising, uh, disagreeable, and I thought, wrong, it's not how the British system works. But I note that within weeks, one of the four had gone, and within two years, all four had gone, including me. Their jobs weren't safe. Later in the year, a scandal hit the Department for Education when it decided exam grades should be decided by an algorithm. The government had had to make an embarrassing U-turn. So the decision we'd made to go down the uh, moderated grades route was a decision that everyone had supported. And in reality, uh, it, it wasn't the right approach, and it became very clear it wasn't the right approach. In past scandals, it had usually been the minister that took the rap, but this time, the top official in the department, Jonathan Slater, came under pressure. There was a bit of anonymous briefing against me. Um, you know, is the permanent secretary of the Department of Education, you know, for the job type stuff. Obviously rather dispiriting, but then you know, it, it, it did seem to become becoming clear uh, that 
uh, questions were being asked as to whether I would need to leave. The only person he could turn to was his boss, the cabinet secretary and head of the civil service, Mark Sedwell. He didn't have anything particular to say other than to refer me to uh, you know, what Dominic Cummings was doing, removing permanent secretaries more generally. He's described permanent secretaries as blockers, so, you know, you can draw your own conclusions from that. Was it fair, though, that the permanent secretary of your department left around that time? I mean, some people say you should have been the fall guy, but he took the bullet for it. Yeah. So I offered to resign. Um, I said, made it quite clear that uh, uh, I offered my resignation and offered to go when the Prime Minister asked me to carry on. I just did everything I could to put that right as quickly as possible. The key was that it was within the rules. The British system concentrates power in the hands of the Prime Minister. Most Prime Ministers, uh, although aware of that, do not exploit that fact, and so the system works. Uh, but Boris Johnson was aware of that and would, tried to use all that power himself. Or people around him were using his name in order to achieve their objectives, which they were aligned with the Prime Minister's. Sounds like maybe not a revolution, but a revolution within the system. It was different from anything that went before. There are good and bad civil servants like there are good and bad politicians. But overall, the British civil service is very loyal to the state, to democracy, to the elected government. So I think sometimes politicians in recent years have played out their frustrations in, you know, in lashing out at the, at the civil service. Years of dispute and delay seem to breed suspicion between Brexiteers and officials, a fear that scores were being settled. What I saw from the outside was this, this, this fraying of the confidence of the civil service to do its job, tell truth under power, uphold standards. And that, that degrades the quality of government. It will mean ministers will take poorer decisions, which will have a bad effect on this country. And the country would soon need a government that could take good decisions more than ever. wildlife markets, the suspected source of this latest virus. With flu-like symptoms. In Wuhan today, an old man collapsed on a street corner. The first thing I knew about what became COVID-19 was reading about a, an unknown pneumonia in China in the newspapers. And then I asked for a briefing when I got into the office the following Monday. And uh, the clinicians in the department, Chris Whitty, uh, Jonathan Van Tam, were already across it. Everyone was starting to see these reports coming out of this obscure city in China. There didn't seem anything particularly to worry about. And then, increasingly, it became clear this was something to worry about, and more questions were being asked. We had a meeting with Matt Hancock in January, and he said, we're not going to avoid this, it's coming potentially thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people will die. It's just like, what? It's like one of those disaster films, you know, with the asteroid heading towards Earth. Something always saves Earth in the end, doesn't it? It turned out to be the biggest nightmare for any government since World War II. The need to act was becoming clear. But Boris Johnson's dislike for the rules was apparent from the start. Hey, good morning. Good morning. How do you do? I was at a hospital the other night where I think there were, a few, there were actually a few coronavirus uh, patients and I shook hands with everybody, uh, you'll be pleased to know, and, and I continue to shake hands. I think Johnson just sort of couldn't believe it was happening to him. He obviously felt uncomfortable with the idea of locking down, but he also has quite a casual attitude to his own health. He thinks he's indestructible and so it was challenging to get him to stop shaking hands with people and to wash his hands and to kind of remember how to kind of interact with people who feel much more cautious than him. We know from WhatsApp messages that have been leaked, not just yours, but others too, you know, over time, that sometimes Boris Johnson was absolutely arguing for uh, 
herd immunity. Sometimes he used the phrase, let it rip. So we're, how aware, I suppose, were you of him going backwards and forwards? How aware was I? God, it was a, it was, it, it was a constant. And the best way I can describe it is that the way that Boris makes decisions is to try out all the arguments. I was trying to get the attention of the Downing Street machine, if you like, and I, I couldn't get the machine to grind into action. Boris is a remarkably bullish type chap. He's a, he's a can-do, he's a, he's a glass half full rather than half empty. He is uh, fundamentally a liberal and, and, and live and let live uh, type person. Truthfully, I think this is where Dominic did have a bit more urgency. He was quite concerned about it. And Dominic's kind of focus in clear-mindedness came up very hard against Johnson's willingness to kind of hear lots of different arguments and not quite make up his mind. Um, and the trouble is that those decisions were life or death. Politicians and government medics were scrambling to make the right decisions. There wasn't a rule book or much of a plan for dealing with an unknown virus. And the notion of a politician telling everyone to stay at home felt unbelievable at first. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for coming along. But finally, Boris Johnson was pushed to act. I remember sitting at the cabinet table and saying across the table, Prime Minister, we're going to have to tell people to stop all unnecessary social contact. From this evening, I must give the British people a very simple instruction. You must stay at home. And I remember having a slight out-of-body experience thinking, here I am at the cabinet table and I'm telling the Prime Minister in all seriousness that he's got to say this to the nation. None of us have ever heard a message like it. No politician alive could ever have imagined delivering it. And that's because the coronavirus crisis is a situation that the country has simply never faced anything like in living memory. Those moments were so strange, so scary, so completely unlike today. This place was empty. Politicians and officials were under overwhelming pressure. Everyone's health was at risk. The economy was in danger, and no one knew how long the pandemic would last or how many people would die. Ministers and civil servants would have to find ways of working together to get the country through it. But of course, they were vulnerable to the virus too. Boris Johnson doesn't get unwell. He, he, he said, I can't remember taking a sick day before, but he started to cough and his temperature started to go up and it became clear that he certainly wasn't well. Boris and I contracted COVID on the same day and we were really worried about about the impact of this on on the public's morale essentially in a way that you don't really worry about morale outside of out of outside of wartime and then for a week we were both ill although i am uh, sequestered here uh, in number 10 dining street i am thanks to the miracles of modern technology able to be in constant touch uh, with my officials with everybody in the various departments across the whole of Whitehall. And then on the Thursday of the next week, I went back into work and I was essentially better. And Boris said to me, I'll, I think I'll just stay off until Monday. And at that point, as I got better, he got very seriously worse. Boris Johnson is in intensive care tonight in a personal fight against the virus that the government and the country is trying to beat. I was told the, the stats of what happens for people who go into ICU. 
I'm no sycophant, but it was someone who I've worked with for years and years and loved dearly. Um, and it was, I was gobsmacked, to be honest. It was a real shock. Did you think you might die? Yeah. Yeah, I, I knew there was absolutely a 50-50 chance of that. Given his weight at the time, I did not think that was a good combination for someone who was becoming so rapidly ill. I was really emotionally affected. And at the same time, there was a huge impact on the leadership of the country. And the Foreign Secretary has been asked to step up for now. And you did this extraordinary interview with Dominic Raab late at night when he, was, he looked incredibly worried. Are you confident, though, that the government is in, under control tonight? There's an incredibly strong team spirit behind the Prime Minister and making sure that we get all of the plans that the Prime Minister has instructed us to deliver to get them implemented as soon as possible. And that's the way we will bring the whole country uh, through the coronavirus challenge that we face right now. Actually, I worried that that interview might really damage the morale of the nation. But what he did absolutely right was not try to look as if he was the stand-in prime minister, which would have been worse. If you're doing my job, there is not a manual for this. I was extremely worried about the impact it would have if he was gone and the shock it would be for the country and how on earth we were going to manage if the worst happened, and you have to just reassure people that it's going to be OK and there is a plan. One of the things I've done is uh, what happens if the Prime Minister is really ill. So um, I remember going back to my office and turning those rough notes into something that looked like maybe a document that had been around <laughs> for a much longer period of time <laughs> in order to just, I mean, just, just as a kind of agenda for a discussion, but, you know, to try to, again, create the illusion that it was, you know, we, we had a list. Good afternoon. I've today left hospital after a week in which the NHS has saved my life. No question. We got that exclusive and it was, it was really fascinating going in to see him that day. Because he was a changed man. He was, he was sitting down a lot more. Normally he leaps around the room and he's, you know, you know what a big character he is. And he was, he was a lot more frail. He'd lost weight um, and his voice was a bit quieter. Um, and it's, sometimes it's hard with Boris to get him to sort of be kind of serious. You know, he likes to be the Joker and so on. It was quite an emotional interview for him. And the Sun's readers were very relieved that he survived and so there was a lot of support for him at that particular time. He got his highest poll rating ever. Uh, <laughs> as people were just, you know, it, 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 you do slightly think if the Prime Minister can die from this, then anybody can. That wave of public support felt like a symbol. In that moment, COVID was changing our relationship with our leaders. For the first time in years, after all the bitterness, many members of the public wanted to believe in their government and to obey their instructions to follow the rules. Are you going to resign, you Mr. Cummings? You go to Barnum Castle. Did you leave the family home in Durham while you Is were Is it there? one rule for you, Mr. Cummings, and another rule for everybody else? It was almost impossible to believe. Number 10 had told the country to stay in their homes. But Boris Johnson's most senior advisor, the man who'd made the plans for lockdown, had been spotted nearly 300 miles away. I didn't know that Dom had gone to Durham, so that surprised me. And I thought the whole thing was just really surreal, actually. I couldn't make any sense of it at all. It seemed a huge betrayal. The most senior staffer in Downing Street had broken the rules he'd helped put in place. All eyes turned to the Prime Minister, expecting him to rebuke his right-hand man. If one of your most senior team wasn't paying proper attention to the rules, why should anyone else? And above all, uh, what he did, if you look at the, uh, the measures that he took, uh, they were designed to stop the spread of uh, the virus. And I think uh, that he, at all times, uh, as I say, behaved responsibly and legally. It was abundantly clear to me, that just like everyone else in the country, that all the rules had been broken. And there was no, absolutely no excuse to it. I did contact Boris. I texted him and, uh, and I said, look, 
you know, what did I tell you? <laughs> and you know, when, I, when I was leaving just a couple of months earlier, I told you this guy's not gonna be content until he burns the house down. Look what he's just gone and done. And if you want any sort of ability to try and survive this and move on, and not let this now lead to a constant weakening of your government, you have to let him go. Sorry, I'm late. I don't want to get into exactly how Boris replied, but let's just say that it was the last thing I was expecting after receiving this reply was that press conference. Boris Johnson not only stood by him, he let Cummings use his back garden to mount his defence. I could barely believe it. There is no regulation covering the situation that I found myself in on Friday night. As a politician watching a master at work, the way he sat at the desk and got you all to come up and address him like a courtly king, it was a masterstroke of politics. Um, and another illustration of why he should never have been allowed anywhere near Downing Street. Do you understand for some people it seems as if there was one version of the rules for you and one version of the rules for everyone else? Um, thank you, Laura. Uh, no, I, no, I don't, I don't regret um, what, what I did. I think that was the point at which I thought, Dominic Cummings, is he mad? Because to do what he did and then to go on television and give what was not even half an apology for how he'd behaved was quite extraordinary. And it was... There was definitely something going on there. How did he think he could behave differently to every other person in the country and yet and not give any apology for it? It was my job to, to then try and explain what our position was and why we were standing by Dom during that time. Obviously, it was difficult. Uh, and I think perhaps even Dom himself has since said um, the sort of comms around it, the way it was handled, could have been, could have been better. It's funny because um, I didn't know at the time that he was, all, he was also trying to get me fired. Um, I was just... That whole episode was not well handled. At the time, it seemed that Cummings was important to the government effort. There was a lot to be done. There was a lot to be done post-Covid. And that Cummings had some very good ideas on the reforms that we needed, and therefore it was worth spending political capital to keep him in place. But that was clearly, in hindsight, a mistake. You know, he chose Dominic against my advice. It was a disaster. I'm afraid nobody likes somebody who says I told them so. I told them so having worked closely with him. Why do you think Boris Johnson does tend to show loyalty to people who have made mistakes? Is it loyalty or is it something else? It's a very particular kind of loyalty, I think. I think people take it very personally and think, yes, he saved my bacon and I owe him so much. But that's the point, you owe him so much now. What do you mean by that? Well, it's worked out well for him to save you. Boris is very loyal. Uh, but that loyalty is conditional, and it's conditional on uh, and, and you know, do you back him in, in everything that he says or does? And, and that's the basis that you win that loyalty. You are the, the leader of the country and the party, and yes, you've got friends, and yes, you've got people who've been loyal to you, but that is a very much a secondary consideration and you have to override those friendships or that loyalty. If there's something you need to do to protect the reputation of government, country. Inside and outside government, Boris Johnson's decision to hang on to his advisor was toxic. So UK civil service uh, official Twitter account says, arrogant and offensive, can you imagine having to work with these truth twisters? It was sent around informally between civil servants and, and discussed, and the, the general comment view was, we don't have to imagine it, we're doing it. This is a sign of the relationship between civil servants and ministers breaking down. This is an exasperated civil servant saying that the 
politicians she or he is working for are not telling the truth. Uh, and it's their exasperation of that that has bubbled up uh, in this public tweeting. This is not good for the civil service, shouldn't be doing this. Um, but you can understand the frustrations that maybe have led to what, in my view, is poor behaviour. I don't want people to think that I'm a, a truth twister, but I understood the anger behind that person running that Twitter account. Some civil servants clearly felt that that's it, they'd been pushed their limits, they couldn't do with this, they couldn't deal with it anymore. This wasn't just about name calling or the odd disagreement here and there. At this point, there wasn't enough PPE in our hospitals. Test and trace was a shambles. The virus appeared to be spreading almost unchecked in our care homes. The government was struggling profoundly to cope with the very urgent demands of the pandemic. And yet, just at the moment when the government machine was needed the most, relationships were breaking down. And soon, even the job of the country's most senior civil servant was on the line. Dom Cummings and Mark Sedwell clashed repeatedly, and everybody knew it. Everybody could hear the clash. You could hear it? Uh, well, because it, the, the, the reverberations were clear um, uh, that Mark Sedwell was defending the system, which Dom Cummings was trying to deconstruct. So it's not a surprise that they, uh, they came, to, they, they, I was going to say they came to blows, but there was ne never anything physical, but they disagreed energetically with each other. Do you mean people could actually hear the shouting matches? I, I never had that, that, that that's, that's misleading. But uh, when Mark told me about the conversations later, they sounded pretty punchy in the sense of sort of out there rather than physical. What people probably never understood was just how testy and toxic and unpleasant it got as a place to work during those periods and the sense from the political team that they thought that, you know, the civil service wasn't really up to much. So there was an awful lot of wasted energy in April, May, June time, I think, on kind of internal fights and people not getting on with each other. A time when we ought to have all been really working well together. There was intense worry about what was going on. Number 10's contempt for rules. Senior officials took an extraordinary step, appealing to Buckingham Palace. Well, I can't talk about the conversation with the palace, I'll get into trouble. But what was it that, was, that you were worried about in government? There were definitely times after the Prime Minister came back from his illness when uh, the kind of, the perception amongst the political team in number 10 about the kind of failings of the system and the failings of the civil service and the failings of different institutions was so extreme. And the way that they are articulating that, they were in absolutely kind of smash everything up, shut it all down, start again. We were systematically in real trouble. By June, Mark Sedwell had had enough and announced he would quit. The unhappy exit of the country's civil service boss and national security adviser was a grave signal. Our system of government was in trouble. I genuinely don't think that either the Prime Minister or any of his really close advisers understood the symbolic impact of the Cabinet Secretary leaving his job. That the whole of the civil service system is kind of reliant on somebody at the top being able to hold a line. And if your boss's boss's boss, or your boss's 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 boss, uh, is no longer there to protect you, that can feel at a time which was very destabilising anyway, even more destabilising. Mark Sedwell was replaced with an ally of number 10, 41-year-old Simon Case. He'd never run a department before, now in charge of a government workforce of nearly half a million people. The fact that Mark Sedwell could just be replaced with somebody who clearly was a very political appointee, who didn't have the experience, the respect of the civil service, sent a very strong, clear message that you're expected to, to tow the line, and towing the line being cover up for mistruths if necessary, 
don't tell politicians things they don't want to hear, don't worry so much about facts and evidence, um, just do as you're told. The Prime Minister and his team wanted to decide everything, not only policies but appointments. And the British system traditionally has been balanced, that uh, patronage and decision making has been devolved. But uh, Boris Johnson's number 10 brought all that into the centre. Uh, so uh, every sort of public appointment was their business and everybody knew that. And the, the, you know, the sort of candidate that was acceptable was clearly someone exactly of their political view, which again has not been the British way. Many people say many things about Boris. Uh, he didn't rest on his laurels. I think there was a desire to, to certainly change the way the government is, is, is operating. You've got to remember you're only as strong or, or, you know, on, on day one. And if we'd have left it any longer to do some of the things we wanted to, it would have been impossible. You can't do big change you know, from middle towards the end of a, of a term. I think people should remember the vaccine rollout, which was fastest in the world. In addition, he got Brexit done. He did get the deal. He, f he fixed it and ended it. Boris Johnson and Dominic Cummings' habit of busting convention had some important success. Lovely, thank you, sir. Yeah. It's hard to imagine a different government creating the vaccine programme in the same way. Yet the relationship had a shelf life. It was combustible from the start. Perhaps now the only real surprise is it took so long to implode. But when Dominic Cummings left, he left behind a government full of turbulence, a system that didn't really seem to work. And as the months went by, the effects of that would be felt not just at home, but abroad. Afghanistan has new masters. 20 years after their first experiment in power came to a shattering end, the Taliban are back. The prime minister's role is absolutely critical. Afghanistan is another example of how cabinet government declined in the years after David Cameron left as prime minister. David Cameron set up the National Security Council, which brings together all the key ministers, military and intelligence chiefs. That didn't really function in the, the Kabul crisis, the Afghanistan withdrawal. The British had gone into Afghanistan with the United States after 9-11. But with troops going home after 20 years, the Taliban took the capital, Kabul, much quicker than anyone had expected. Afghans who'd risked their lives to work with the British forces were targets and needed to escape. To get them out, the Foreign Office set up a crisis centre in London. Civil servant Josie Stewart offered to help. There was no ability to prioritise any of these people and what very quickly ended up being what we actually did was search for and give updates to politicians, to ministers and MPs about individuals that they knew and cared about, either that they knew personally or that their constituents were lobbying them on. High profile people with connections. What about us? We are working with them, we support them. Afghanistan was impossible. It was an international disaster, every way you look in every single way. And it was one of the worst two weeks of my life because you didn't sleep, because you had a list of people that you needed to get out. And it was fighting the system and arguing and working out where these people were. We were spending our time on the wrong things. And there was a terrifying humanitarian crisis playing out. The evacuation descended into chaos and desperation on the ground. Thousands stranded at Kabul airport, but the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, was nowhere to be seen. Government officials asked the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, on Friday to urgently call his Afghan opposite number. Mr Raab was not at his usual desk. He was on holiday in Crete, and the call was delegated to a junior minister instead. Labour said he should be sacked or quit. It was a complete abdication of personal responsibility not to come home. 
The foremost job of the Foreign Secretary is to support his people and to make sure things get done. And I will never accept any reasoning for that. It was wrong. Rab dismissed his critics, claiming he'd been working all along. But he didn't need to worry. Boris Johnson's response was his usual, stand by your supporters as long as they support you. But it wasn't long before Johnson also came under attack, with thousands still stranded at Kabul airport. A plane carrying animals from Nauzad, a charity run by a former British Marine headed to safety. In the end, a plane left Kabul with only one passenger, Pen Farthing, and a load of dogs and cats. As far as I'm aware, it was never the case that there was any sort of decision to prioritise animals over people. Um, but there was a decision to evacuate Nauzad's Afghan staff, whom, according to policy, were not priorities. It was common belief in the crisis centre that that decision came from the Prime Minister, Boris Johnson. I saw emails confirming it had been discussed with Number 10 and with the Cabinet Office. Did you intervene that way? No, that's complete nonsense. Today, Boris Johnson again denied he'd had a hand in it. No, and that is absolutely... This whole thing is, is, is total rhubarb. Boris Johnson had announced publicly that he had nothing to do with it and did not make the decision, and officials felt unable to say that that was not true. They could not say that the Prime Minister was lying. Josie Stewart voiced her concerns about the evacuation to the media. She was later sacked by the Foreign Office. Despite an MP's inquiry finding no alternative explanation, Number 10 repeatedly denied any involvement by the Prime Minister. The Foreign Office argued his association was a communication error. Boris Johnson himself hailed the whole thing a great success. I think that the operation of pitting to, to, to airlift 15,000 uh, people out of Kabul uh, in the way that we did over the, the summer was one of the outstanding military achievements uh, of, the, uh, of the last 50 years or more. In policy terms and human terms, it was a horrible moment for the Foreign Office, and it is not possible to present that evacuation as any kind of success. Uh, it was the Ministry of Defence who had to go and rescue the situation. So there are, again, important lessons for the future. We won't always be able to foresee what is going to happen, um, but the system should be able to cope with it across departments. The UK's reputation as a major power had taken a serious hit on Boris Johnson's watch. He was looking less like a prime minister with a historic opportunity and more like a liability. Yesterday I went, uh, as, as we all must, uh, uh, to, to Peppa Pig World. I don't know if you've been to Peppa Pig World. Who's been to Pans? I've been who's been to Peppa Pig World. Not enough. In the past, in Boris Johnson had happily and colourfully dismissed business upset about Brexit. After a bumpy time as Prime Minister, this speech to the CBI business group was an important chance to show he took industry seriously. Uh, forgive me. Forgive me. This speech was so bizarre and sort of Trumpian that um, I think a lot of people were quite shocked. There were a lot of raised eyebrows of people thinking, is this a serious person? I don't know. I think that the hardest part is that he likes chaos, so he doesn't want to be organised particularly. In your speech to the CBI, you lost your notes, you lost your place, you went off on a tangent about Peppa Pig. Frankly, is everything OK? I think that uh, I think that people uh, got the vast majority of the uh, the points I wanted to make, and I thought uh, I thought it went over well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It looked more like a pantomime, not the mastery of power. 
Mr. Mr. Speaker, I think he's lost his place in his notes again. The operation of British government depends greatly on how the Prime Minister of the day exercises their functions personally. Whether they read the memos, whether they chair the meeting, the questions that they ask every day, the system responds to that. And if that doesn't happen, the system starts to be all over the place. And, and senior people in Downing Street tell the BBC it's just not working. Is everything OK, Prime Minister? Prime Minister! We came in on a high, supporting in him, him, believing in him, hoping that he would break some of the things that people hate most about politics. And the problem you had was there was poor management of the system. There were people put in positions of power who shouldn't have been. The majority went to Boris's head, and it went to the head of those around him. I used to be a big believer in, you know, the flexible power of the Prime Minister and what a fantastic thing that was. And uh, I'm not as big a believer in that anymore. So I would absolutely strengthen those kind of the, the kind of hard wiring bits of the state and make sure that it was government had to be more transparent, people had to be more accountable, the independent offices have to be stronger and take some of the kind of poison out of the world in which we seem to have accidentally fallen into. There was never a question about Boris Johnson's ability to light up a campaign. But there was always a question about whether he was up to the job or fit for office. And that was asked again and again, more and more loudly, as soon as he took charge. He created an administration that was casual about the rules and the truth and presided over chaos just at the time when the country needed its government in crisis. And the biggest irony, his election win was meant to give us stability we hadn't had for years. But the reality, with him in charge, it rarely felt like that at all. People do give him a second chance and a third chance and, and a fourth chance, and, and that is down to sheer force of personality. It's amazing. Some people have dogs like that, that know, and I don't want to compare the promise to a dog, but I've, I've had Dachshunds, and no matter what my Dachshund did, no matter how many carpets he chewed through, I mean, bluntly how many curtains he peed on and cocked his leg on, he still loved him because he was a Dachshund and he's there, and this Boris has this amazing sort of charm and ability. Oh, bloody hell, it's Boris again, but it is Boris, you know, good. Next time, Tory infighting tears off Boris Johnson's crown. We were getting a resignation every half an hour. After market mayhem, the party's second prime minister in just over a hundred days sacrifices her closest ally. I said, this isn't going to save you. I think you've got three weeks now. 